Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series on sorting algorithms. Today we'll be discussing a far more efficient variation on insertion sort. Now if you haven't already, I'd recommend watching our video on insertion sort before this one, as some of the information that I referenced today will be directly pulled from that video. Additionally, it's going to make this video much easier to understand. With all that being said, let's begin. Now before we hop into a definition, let's take a look at what the major downfall of insertion sort was. Now if you remember, the algorithm was extremely inefficient when it came to sorting large data sets, having an O of n squared average and worst case scenario time complexity equation. The reason for this was that when we were placing an element at its correct place in the list, we only moved it one position at a time. This means that if we have a small element that's on the far right of the list, and it needs to be placed towards the beginning of the list, we would need to shift a ton of elements in order to place it at its correct location in the list. So, if the major downfall of insertion sort was that we only moved elements one position at a time, what would be a good solution to this problem? Well, the answer, as you might have guessed, comes in the form of shell sort. The main idea behind shell sort is allowing the exchange of far items. Imagine that same scenario as before. Only now, we can simply exchange the large element on the right side of the list with one of the much lower elements. This would speed things up tremendously. How we actually do this is going to be a little bit more complicated than that, but before we hop directly into pseudocode, let's get down to a formal definition. We can define shell sort as a variation of insertion sort, which breaks the list down into smaller and smaller sublists, and then individually sorts these sublists using insertion sort. These sublists are chosen by a gap variable, which creates equal subsets of data that are all a certain number of elements apart. This is a semi-difficult concept to wrap your head around, so let's pull up an example. Say we had a list like so, and we wanted to break the list up into three sublists, each containing elements that are three positions away from each other. So, for example, the first sublist consists of the elements at index locations 0, 2, and 4. These elements would create the first sublist. Then, following suit, the second sublist would consist of the elements at index locations 1, 3, and 5. Finally, the third sublist would consist of the elements at index locations 2, 4, and 6. Using this process, we have now broken up the list into three smaller sublists, each with elements that are equidistant apart from each other. So what? Well, now let's sort these sublists. Placing the elements in the first sublist in ascending order yields this. Placing the elements in the second sublist in order yields this. And sorting the third sublist gives us this. Each individual sublist is now sorted. However, as you'll notice, the entire list isn't sorted. What you might be able to notice, though, is that the elements are actually much closer to their actual locations than they were before. If we pull up the original list, this becomes pretty evident. Essentially, we have moved the elements closer to their correct positions. From here, what we can actually do is perform a simple insertion sort on the remaining list, and it will bring the dataset into a sorted state much quicker than simply using a typical insertion sort would have from the beginning. That's essentially the meat and potatoes of shell sort. We divide the list into a number of sublists, and then perform a modified insertion sort on each of those sublists based on a gap value. The gap determines how far apart elements in the sublist are, and we reduce this gap on each recurring pass through the list until we finally just end up performing a basic insertion sort to finish off the sort. This does leave out a very important question though, and that is how we determine this gap variable. Put simply, how do we know how many elements to skip over when making our sublists? Well, generally, we start with the size of the list divided by 2, since this takes care of any large jumps in the data that need to be made. Then, the most common practice is to divide that number in half again and again until it hits 1. So, for example, in a list of 8 elements, the gap would start off at 4, then it'd be 2, and then 1. Once the gap hits 1, well that's when we simply end up performing a basic insertion sort since a sublist with elements one space apart from each other will just end up being the entire list. Okay, now that we have the basics down, 
let's get a little bit more formal and jump into the actual pseudocode. Much like insertion sort, we pass in two formal parameters into the function. The first is the actual array that we want to sort, or r, and the second is the size of the array, which I'll call r size. The first step once we enter the pseudocode is to immediately hop into a for loop. This for loop will be used to set up the gap sequence that is the basis for shell sort. So we want to start by defining an integer gap, which is equal to r size divided by 2. That's the initial gap value that we'll use. Then, while the gap is greater than 0, we want to reduce the gap by dividing it in half, which we can do by using the divide equals operator. This for loop will give us our correct gap sizes that we want for our different iterations to the list. Then, once we're in this loop, we need to perform a modified insertion sort on each of the sublists that were created by taking elements that are separated by a number of elements that are equal to the gap variable that we just created. This methodology might look familiar since it's extremely similar to what we did for insertion sort. The first thing we do is jump into another for loop. We initialize a variable i, which starts at the gap. This way, we start at the last element in each sublist. Pulling up our previous example of nine elements, you can see that this means that i will end up starting at the sixth, seventh, and eighth indexes respectively. Each of these elements are the last element in their respective sublist. Thus, if we decrement this variable i by the gap, we can cover the entirety of the list. We run this for loop while i is less than r size, incrementing i by 1. This is the setup for actually sorting the sublists. Essentially, we go through the list, alternating sublists that we're sorting, and take turns placing an element in a particular sublist at its correct position in the sublist. We'll know which sublist we're on here because we have the gap variable. Decrementing i by the gap variable at any point will ensure that the element at that index is still a part of the sublist containing the element at i. Okay, the next thing we have to do is implement the actual comparison and swapping system. We start by storing the element at index location i in a variable called key. This key element is the integer that we want to place at its correct position in the sublist. We then set an integer j equal to the indexing variable i. This will be a traveling index that is used to travel to other integers in the same sublist as the key element and help us compare them accordingly. Now for the while condition. The first part is pretty simple. We want to stop j before it goes out of bounds of the array, in the case that the key element is the lowest integer in its sublist. Since we start at the gap index and only ever decrease j by the gap, this condition will simply stop the while loop at the first element in each sublist. Going past it will result in the termination of the while loop. Essentially, this serves as a stop case to prevent out-of-bounds errors. The second condition is just looking for an element that is less than the key element. Remember, we're trying to put this sublist in ascending order. Once we find an element that is less than the key element, we know that the correct location for the key element is at index location j. Stopping at this point will allow us to locate the correct location for the key element. The functionality inside the while loop simply serves to make room for the incoming key element. While we still don't know where the key element should go, which is evidenced by us still being in the while loop, we move the element that's just below the current one up to the current one. This will create room for the eventual placement of the key element at its rightful place in the sublist. We then decrement j by the gap variable. This takes us to the next element in the sublist. Finally, the last step is to actually place the key element at its correct location in the list, which, after everything is said and done, will be at index location j. So, as a recap, we store a key element to be placed at its correct location in the sublist. We then loop through the sublist until we find that correct location, while simultaneously moving elements up to make room for it. And finally, we store the key element at its correct location in the sublist. 
Hopefully now it makes more sense to you how we actually sort the list using the gap method. Now we're going to make things even clearer by doing an example shell sort and then looking at things through the visualizer. If you watched our video on insertion sort, you'll know that the comparison process does take forever. So we'll be abstracting a lot of the variable comparisons in this video, as painful as that is going to be for our add rates. Okay, so say we have a list of eight elements like so. According to our pseudocode, the first thing that we must do is calculate a gap variable. This gap variable is initially set to the size of the list, r size, divided by 2. Since the size of the list is 8 elements, this makes our initial gap 4. What this means is that we will have 4 equal sublists, each 4 elements apart from each other. Let's signify this by color coding each separate sublist on our array, like so. The next step is to enter our inner for loop. This is the one that will take care of sorting the sublists. We start at the index location of gap, i, which is 4. This means that we're going to start by sorting the sublist that contains 6 and 5. Let's make that a little more apparent on the visuals. I'm going to abstract out all of the comparison and swapping of values here, since we did a very thorough job of that process in our video on insertion sort. Essentially, the code that's contained within the inner for loop will sort this sublist in ascending order using the modified insertion sort pseudocode that we just went over. Putting all of that technical jargon simply, 5 and 6 will end up getting swapped. We then go back to the inner for loop and increment i, which makes it 5. Now we sort the sublist that contains 1 and 4. Since 1 and 4 are already in sorted order, we don't need to make any changes here, and can simply increment i so that it's now 6. Looking at the sublist that contains 2 and 7, we can see that these elements are also in sorted order, and so no changes need to be made there either. Finally, incrementing i one more time has it set to 7, which means we sort the sublist containing 8 and 3. Since 8 and 3 are out of order, we swap them to complete the insertion sort for that sublist. And with that, we have completed our shell sort with a gap of four elements. Things are definitely not perfect here, and that's to be expected. The good part is that the list is now much closer to being sorted. What we now do is go all the way back to our initial for loop and recalculate the gap variable. We divide the old gap variable by two, which makes the new gap variable two. This means we will now have two equal sublists, and they will contain elements that are two elements apart. Let's update the list to match this change, and enter back into our inner for loop. We set our integer i equal to the gap variable, which is 2, and then begin sorting the different sublists. To make things more clear, I'm going to do each sublist one at a time. In an actual shell sort, it would go back and forth between the two lists, sorting one element at a time. But that is quite confusing, so I'm just going to do each sublist one at a time, which is why you'll see the index location i move around a bunch. Okay, so, we start with the sublist that contains 2, which we can see if we gray out the other sublist. Sorting this first sublist, you can see that by insertion sorting these four elements, will leave us with an updated sublist of 2, 5, 6, and 7. We then move on to the second sublist. This sublist starts at index location 1. As you might be able to tell, this sublist is already sorted, so we don't need to make any changes, leaving the list as 1, 3, 4, and 8. Bringing the two sublists back together, you can see that while we don't have a sorted list, it is fairly close. Now what we need to do is go all the way back to the initial for loop and recalculate the gap one more time. This time, divide it by 2, such that it is 1. Now, the final step is to simply start i at index location 1 and perform just a basic insertion sort. So 1 goes in its place by swapping it with 2. 5 is currently in its correct place, and so we don't need to do anything there. 3 gets swapped with 5, which puts it in its correct location. 6 is currently in its correct location, so we don't need to do anything there. We place 4 in between 3 and 5, which puts it in its correct location. And finally 7, 
and 8 are already in their correct order, and so we are finished up here. And that's how you sort a list using shell sort. Again, like I said, I abstracted out a lot of the actual insertion sorting since we went through a very intricate example in our last video. If you are at all confused about how we got to this point, I'd recommend watching that video, since it goes way more in depth than I did here. Moving on though, now let's look at how shellsort performs on a large scale using the visualizer. As we start the algorithm, you might be able to tell pretty quickly that it functions visually very different from insertion sort. As the algorithm goes on and on, you can definitely see the different passes through the list, with the gap getting smaller and smaller each time. Each element is moved closer and closer to its actual position, as the gap variable shrinks, and eventually, as you're seeing now, we just ended off by performing a simple insertion sort on the remaining elements. The good thing, though, is that because all of the elements are closer to their correct positions, it takes way less time for them to reach it than a traditional insertion sort would. Neat. Now that we know how shell sort works in practice, let's talk about shell sort as an algorithm in terms of its time complexity equations. Now, evaluating the time complexity equations for shell sort is a little bit complicated, since there are variations in the code. Depending on which equation you use to calculate the gap, the time complexity could be worse or better depending on the particular data set that you're trying to sort. Some programs have shell sorting gap equations that are optimized for the type of data that they will receive, while others just use the general divide by two strategy. As a good rule of thumb, however, shell sort is going to have a best and average case scenario time complexity equation of O n log n, and also a worst case scenario time complexity equation of O of n squared. In addition to this, it will have a space complexity of O of 1, since, just like insertion sort, we don't use any extraneous memory to sort the array. Finally, shell sort is an unstable algorithm, meaning that duplicate elements do not have their order preserved in the final sorting of the list. If you're unfamiliar with stability, we go over it in our video on selection sort, which is linked in the description below. Now, the only other noteworthy thing to talk about here is the fact that shell sort's best case scenario time complexity equation is actually worse than insertion sort's. This is because if we are given a sorted array, we don't simply run through it just once like we would do with an insertion sort. We run through it with the gap at n divided by 2, then n divided by 4, n divided by 8, and so on and so on until we get to the point where we run an insertion sort and complete the sorted list. This ends up being n log n comparisons, which is why it performs worse in this category than insertion sort. On average though, shell sort is going to be much better than insertion sort. Being able to move the elements long distances, as opposed to just one at a time, makes things much 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 more efficient, especially in the long run. Finally, we need to discuss common implementations of shell sort. Where is this algorithm actually used? And unfortunately, not too many places. Again, as with most algorithms, it is dominated and outperformed by the big three heap sort, merge sort, and quick sort. It can be implemented in some cases, though, where the datasets are large enough that an O of n squared worst case scenario algorithm won't work, but it is run on software with limited memory, and so the non constant space complexity algorithms don't work either. This is, of course, a reach though, and I'd be lying to you if I said that this algorithm is going to come up often as you progress throughout your computer science journey. That being said, the algorithm is intriguing, and any algorithm or piece of code that you learn or work on is going to help you become a better computer scientist. Sometimes, to appreciate the amazing algorithms, we must look at the not-so-amazing ones. And with that concludes our discussion on shell sort. As a review, shell sort is a variation of insertion sort, which breaks the list into smaller sublists, which are then individually sorted using insertion sort. These sublists are chosen by a gap variable, which creates subsets of items that are all a certain number of elements apart. As always, if you are confused about any part of this video, please use the timestamps in the description below to go back to rewatch any particular segment, or leave a comment down below with your question. Next week, we will move into the final phase of our sorting algorithm series, so make sure you